Every visible indication pointed to Jesus dying a loser, jeered at, beaten, and made to hang on a shameful cross. But God's purposes cannot be thwarted. All of Satan's forces could not prevent the redemption Christ was achieving for all who would believe. And Satan saw on that cross the certainty of his own appointment with a lake of eternal fire. Stay with us. From Chicago's Moody Church, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. In this, the fifth part of his series, What is God Up To?, Dr. Lutzer today traces the story of the central event in human history, the death of Christ on the cross, in a message he's entitled, Dying a Winner. There was a Roman poet by the name of Horace who was giving some guidelines for playwriters in his day, and he criticized them for too readily bringing a god onto the stage to solve the complicated plot they had created. Said this Roman poet, Horace, Quote, do not bring a god on the stage unless the problem deserves a god to solve it. Well, if you've been listening to these messages, you know that we have a problem that only God is able to solve. And I've been emphasizing that the earth actually is like a stage and there's a drama that is being played out. And you have all of the different characters participating, and God created this stage, and then he created a wonderful canopy called the whole universe. And this drama is being played out on this little small planet. Issues of justice and injustice, righteousness, light versus darkness, it's all happening right here. And the angels are watching, and God is watching, and the demons are watching, and we're watching as the play is enacted. But there is a problem on planet Earth that only God can solve, and we must bring him onto the stage. Let me take a moment to review with you who the players are. First of all, there's Satan, of course, that strong, powerful, beautiful, evil being who chose against God and decided that he would not let God rule over him. And along with him, there were tens of thousands of lesser spirits called demons who do his bidding, who are party to his absurdities, and they fell too in rebellion against God. And then, of course, you have mankind. Remember what happened there in the garden when Adam and Eve decided to participate with Satan in their rebellion and anger toward God. And they ate of the fruit and they became participants in standing against the sovereignty of Almighty God. What could God do in this situation? What are his options? One of the options would be for God to take all of humanity and all the forces of Satan, confine them to hell, and allow them to think throughout all of eternity about the blunder, the serious blunder of rebellion that they created for themselves. That would be one option. Now, if God were to do that, I want to affirm the fact that he would be totally just and that throughout all of eternity, all the universe would stand in awe of the justice of Almighty God. But there'd be a problem if God would have done that, and that is that only one of his attributes would really clearly be seen. Two, actually. In the creation of the universe, God showed us his, his mighty, awesome power, and in creating beings who would choose against him and confining them to everlasting torment, he would be showing us his justice. But that is really all that the universe would see of God. So God decided that there would be another plan, one that would enable his mercy and his grace and his love and all the other attributes that combine to make God. These attributes also would be given specific glorious expression. Now, I'm sure that when Satan uh, asked Adam and Eve to sin and tempted them to do that, 
and then they did exactly what he wanted. He had no idea that God was going to redeem part of the human race back to himself and reverse the curse. Satan didn't know that. In his glee and in his excitement, he thought to himself that now that man has chosen to stand against God, that the curse would be universal, everyone who would be born would be tainted with sin from here on out, and therefore consigned to everlasting rebellion and anger against God. That's what he thought. But God had a plan, a secret plan. And uh, Satan began to see the outworking of that plan, as we noticed in the message last week. But now we see the plan come to its completion. What are the rules by which this plan is going to be executed? First of all, the Lord knew that whatever would be done to redeem a part of humanity back to God, whatever was done would have to be done totally and wholly by God. Salvation would have to be of the Lord. Obviously, God could not look to man to participate because, first of all, men and women are tainted with sin and God is inexpressibly holy and therefore any righteousness that people might want to contribute toward this would of necessity be disqualified. The only righteousness that God accepts is his own. Salvation would have to be of the Lord. There's a second rule and that is that none of the attributes of God could ever be compromised. None of the attributes of God could be compromised. There could be no such thing as God looking at sin and then compromising his holiness and his integrity in salvation. That we know to be the case. No possibility of God bending just because we're sinners. Now, how did God do it? You know how we would have done it? We would have ordered a media campaign. We would have got a newsman, an advance press corps. We would have uh, invited the hosts of the universe. We would have invited angels and demons and all of humanity. And God would have said, guess what I'm going to do? And I want everybody to watch. And we're going to have live, huge screens by which the world will be able to watch because God is coming to town. That's the way we'd have done it. But God, who loves to do things differently than we, whose thoughts are not our thoughts and whose ways are not our ways,